Hey everybody, Pastor Sullivan here at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas, answering your questions here on ATP Ask the Pastor. Today somebody asks, Dear Pastor, thank you for your many videos. Watching the video on the hardening of Pharaoh's heart brought to mind Jacob and Esau. As these are two uh, passages that uh, Calvinist friends of mine have pointed to as evidence of double predestination. What are the differences between the Calvinist and Lutheran interpretations of Romans 9.13 which says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. All right, so interpreting the Lord's words, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, is teaching an absolute predestination, reads a whole lot into the text that just ain't there. John Calvin described the transfer of the honor of the firstborn to Jacob to be like a portent, uh, which, as Paul contends, testified to the election of Jacob and the reprobation of Esau. However, if we look at the text, then we see that there are several reasons why this word isn't about the election of Jacob to eternal blessedness and Esau to eternal punishment. First, let's deal with the most glaring difficulty, and that's the word hate. The word hate in Scripture doesn't always uh, mean hatred in an absolute sense, uh, as in uh, extreme dislike aversion or hostility. Now, there are times it does mean that, but there are often times in which to hate something means to esteem it less than something else. And a great example of this comes from the life of Jacob. Moses writes in Genesis 29, 30 and 31, that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. And later, when he saw that the Lord, or excuse me, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. Except Unloved in the Masoretic text, in the Hebrew text, and in the Greek translations are hated. So Jacob hated Leah. Uh, he didn't esteem her, value her, or love her in the same way or to the same extent that he esteemed, valued, and loved Rachel. Jesus also uses the word hate in this way, uh, in this sense. Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So when disciples try to serve God and mammon, it's not that they're openly hostile towards God, but they think too little of him. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't esteem him as they should, because they esteem mammon more. In Luke uh, 14, 26, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Christ doesn't want us or require us to be hostile to our families in order to follow him. He's telling us that we can't think more highly of them than we do Jesus. We can't, uh, we can't allow them to remain in sin. We can't give them a pass uh, simply because they're our family. Uh, but rather, that, that, would be to, that would be to love them more so uh, and hate Jesus then, to esteem him less than our families. John uh, 12, 25, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Again, Christ isn't calling us to be hostile towards ourselves and our life in this world. He's not calling us to be self-destructive, but rather, he is telling us, uh, he is uh, telling us to value the things that he gives, the life and the word, the life that he gives, more than we value the things of this life. Uh, you know, these passages then show us that it's not right to read Esau I have hated uh, and immediately assume that God has an absolute hatred for him and therefore predestined him to eternal damnation. Rather, God esteemed Jacob more by choosing him, by grace, not on account of his works or merits, but by choosing him to inherit the promise of the Messiah and the land of Canaan. In fact, uh, Scripture doesn't even tell us that Esau died in impenitence. The last thing we hear of Esau is that he and Jacob have buried the hatchet when they bury their father in Genesis 35, 29. So that's the whole hating business. Next, it's helpful to look at the word that the Lord spoke to Rebekah while the two twins were in her womb. So the Lord tells her in Genesis 25, 23, 
Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, this prophecy isn't about Jacob and Esau as individuals, but uh, as representatives of the nations that will come from them. Edom, coming from Esau, and Israel, coming from Jacob. During their life, the, the actual life of Jacob and Esau, we never see Esau serving Jacob. In fact, we, we see the opposite. Uh, when Jacob returns from Paddan Aram in Genesis 20, or excuse me, 32 and 33, uh, he addresses his brother Esau as my Lord seven times in those chapters. And in 33 verse 3, when Esau approached him, he bowed himself to the ground seven times and sought Esau's favor with gifts. So we don't see this prophecy being fulfilled in the individuals of Jacob and Esau, but in the nations that come from them. And this is what we see then throughout the rest of the Old Testament as well, in the conflict between Edom and Israel, uh, the two nations that were in Rebekah's womb in the persons of Esau and Jacob. So David subdued the Edomites. In 2 Samuel 8.14, it says that David put garrisons all throughout Edom, and all the Edomites became David's servants. 2 Kings 8.22 tells us that since the reign of Joram, the Edomites often revolted against Israel. And in 2 Kings 14.7, King Amaziah subdued the Edomites once again. So all throughout uh, the history of Israel and Edom, uh, there is this infighting then, uh, and the nation that comes from the firstborn, the Edomites, serves the nation that came from the younger son, the Israelites. Now this is the context then of the Lord's words in Malachi 1 verses 2 and 3. The Israelites questioned whether or not God loved them, and the Lord answers them, was not Jacob, or excuse me, was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord. Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Those are the words then that Paul is quoting in Romans 9, 13. And they're not about eternal election. They're about God's promise to give the land of Canaan uh, to Jacob's descendants, to give them dominion over Esau's descendants, and most importantly, to bring the Messiah into the world through the, uh, through the descendants of Jacob, not Esau. You know, Calvin rejected this interpretation. Uh, he imagined that the transfer of the right of the firstborn uh, was, as he said, an earthly symbol to declare Jacob's spiritual election. But imagining that Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, means God predestined Jacob to life and Esau to damnation, it ignores all of this evidence. It also then, finally, ignores the, the point of Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, Paul is addressing the Jewish rejection of their own Messiah uh, and the fact that they put their confidence in the fact that they are biologically children of Abraham. So St. Paul in that chapter then deploys two examples against this idea, uh, Ishmael and Esau. Both were children of Abraham according to the flesh. And he deploys both of these as, as examples to show that it isn't those who are biologically related to Abraham that inherit the promise, but those who, as he says in Romans 4.12, walk in the footsteps of the faith of Abraham. Both Ishmael and Esau were children of Abraham according to the flesh, but neither received the promise of the land of Canaan or that the Messiah would come from their descendants. God demonstrates uh, through Isaac that it's not physical birth that makes one a child of God, uh, a child of Abraham, rather, excuse me, uh, but it's, it's the promise which is received by faith. You know, God demonstrates through Jacob then that, that works and merits don't inherit the promise, but faith, which embraces the divine promise. So the Jews who rejected their own Messiah then can't claim to be inheritors of the promise of Abraham because of their birth on the one hand or because of their works on the other. That's Paul's point in Romans chapter 9. Now, can Paul's words be applied to eternal election? Sure. 
not as a symbol of Jacob's eternal election, as Calvin believed, and Esau's eternal damnation, uh, but rather as a type. Johann Gerhard wrote this, Just as the external privilege of dominion and the promise of the land of Canaan were not dependent on carnal propagation nor on the merits of works, but on the free mercy of God, so the heritage of eternal life does not belong to those who rely upon their carnal birth from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or who seek their salvation in works, but to those who place all their hope solely in the free favor of God who elects. While Isaac and Jacob can both be seen as types of God's eternal election of believers, we can't see Ishmael or Esau as types of election to damnation by an absolute decree. That is without regard for faith and unbelief. Paul, Moses, and Malachi, none of them make that assertion, nor could they, uh, since to do so would contradict God's revealed, uh, God's revealed will in Scripture that he desires all men to be saved and come to faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hope that helps. We'll see you next time for another episode of ATP. Ask the Pastor.